It's go time. Is it at all possible that Dwayne Ford of TSN listens to this podcast? Let's find out. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Quick Kicks. Don Charbon here with Heath Graham and Patrick Mooney. Patrick, a big day for you on a different front. Yep. It, it was, yeah. It's uh, a day where we welcomed our first grandson into our family, so we're pretty excited about it. Congratulations. Dwayne Ford, in an interview with Justin Dunk that you can see on YouTube on the Three Down Nations uh, channel, referred to an idea that we have brought out a couple years ago, where if the CFL can get to a 10th team, then the scheduling would be you play three games against every team in your own division. That gives you 12 games. You play one game across the way in the other division. That gets you to 17. And then based on where you finished the previous year, you could call it strength of record, whatever you want to call it. One would play one, two would play two, three would play three, and that would be your 18th game. In his interview, Dwayne Ford championed that idea. We know, as you mentioned, we have discussed this scheduling numerous times, and the two logical ways to schedule an 18 game season in a 10 team league would be either completely balanced schedule where you play everybody twice, but then you would be playing more games against the other division than you would be within your own division or go this route of everybody three times within your division, everybody across the way once and the strength of schedule game as your 18th game. It makes the most sense. It makes the games within your own division that much more important because you see those opponents three times. It's the way to go, in my opinion, perfect sense when we get that 10th team in the league. And hopefully that 10th team comes sooner than later. We've heard the commissioner talk a little bit about that this week, and he's excited to uh, be saying that, hey, it's time to stop talking. And we've, we've gone over this before during COVID times. We're talking about talking. It's time to get down to some action. That was another interview that he conducted with Justin Dunk. And in that interview, yes, the commissioner said enough talking because it gets tiresome. The whole idea is, is that, as we pointed out in a previous podcast, Schooner Sports and Entertainment have essentially taken a back seat to this process right now. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily completely out of the game, but they are certainly pulling back. That opens the door for other interested parties to get involved, as it were, and try to build a, a community-based team. The notion that the CFL was proposing was to have a mix of permanent slash temporary seating in a stadium. And it's been done, as we've pointed out, with BC for two years. Uh, Grey Cups is another great example, actually, where temporary seating is brought in to bolster the attendance. The Atlantic Canada idea would be that you would start with that, develop your market, and then... Once local entities, namely governments or the federal government per se, look at this and say, this is a viable opportunity for everybody. Let's make a multi-purpose stadium. Make sure that it's not, it's not just tied to the football team and have the, the community-based teams or the university teams play there and maybe soccer and maybe field hockey and have concerts and stuff like that, then it would be much more palatable, I think, to local government or regional government to pursue this further. He, in his conversation, sort of rebuffed an idea that was brought out by John Hodge of Three Down. John Hodge had said, why not just the CFL start the team themselves, spread out the cost across the entire league, as they had done with the Montreal Alouettes prior to 2019 and what they did for a very short term this year, do it that way. But um, Craig Reynolds and a couple of other GM, or I should say Craig Reynolds and a couple of other presidents have already come out and said they're not that thrilled about the idea. And Ambrosi himself said if someone came to him from the governors and said, let's give this a try, he'd probably counsel against it. 
It's one thing to have the league and the teams float the cost to keep one franchise alive. It's a whole different scenario when you're looking at the other team stepping up to bring a new team on. Uh, for the sanctity of the league, it's important to keep the current teams afloat, but I can certainly see why there is some disparaging thoughts on a CFL-controlled 10th team at this point. The CFL, in controlling a team, should be only doing it for transition. I don't think it's a smart business move to put the CFL in charge of a, a, a team in order to hopefully attract someone down the line. Teams that have been there for some time and need financial support for a short period, that's a viable situation to transition to a new owner because we know the value that owners bring into the situation. And I think if the CFL is going to expand, you need to find an owner from the area who's invested in the team because we've seen what a difference that makes in markets like BC right now. Your point is well taken and that's something that the commissioner spoke to as well. The made in Atlantic Canada solution is what Ambrosi is definitely a champion of at this point, if that can work. Now, they did use that investment bank to help with the Alouette situation, and I'm sure buoyed by that success, the league is saying there's got to be somebody that's available to us now. And even in the responding to questions, they said, well, where was the ownership group now when you were looking for owners back in 2018, 2019? And quite rightly, uh, Ambrosi said, there are times when people just don't show up until the time is right. And this happened to be the case with Pierre-Carl Pelado when it felt right for him. Seeing what the league was going to do, seeing how it had, it had survived the pandemic and had come out the other side, he saw this as the opportunity. Maybe that's what we're going to see in Atlantic Canada. Now that there is genius sports, now that there's legalized betting, now that there's game day betting, all this sort of stuff coming together, maybe that says, okay, I'm person X. I'm totally thinking this is going to be more than just viable. Let's give it a go. I believe with the Pelado and the Montreal Alouette situation, the timing of it also plays in a little bit of the expiring TV contracts coming up. Had they launched into this bid in 2018, 2019, they were looking at six, seven years down the road before TVA would have the opportunity to even consider bidding on French broadcast rights. Now we're two years away and it's an opportunity to to build that brand and reinvigorate interest in the Montreal Alouettes and then try to spin it towards your own media company. It's it's a, an understandable difference between 2019 and 2023. You see Palado right now signing uh, an agreement with one of his subsidies of Quebecer with Videotron. They came this week and announced that the Alouettes have a partnership with Videotron, which is going to put their logo right on the jersey and also hopefully provide some further coverage in that Quebec area. I think that's going to be crucial to that team's success. You want, again, to have local teams get invested and stand behind, and I think this is a good move as well for Pelado to take that opportunity to not only buy the team, but then to start looking at partnerships within some businesses. They happen to be his, which is a good business decision for him at the time, but businesses in the local area can do nothing but but enhance the success of that team. Pierre-Carl Pelado at his press conference, spoke of his appreciation of the Alouettes and what that team means to the Montreal market in terms of culture, in terms of entertainment value. He's not in this to just try to push this team to make as much money as possible. He's in it for a bigger gain, and that is to make the team something that Montrealers and Quebecers will talk about every time they see or hear anything about football. And that's the way to think of it. BC has done that. BC right now is on everybody's minds because of what Omar Daman has been doing out there to the point where Gronk, Rob Gronkowski, made a reference and jokingly about playing for the BC Lions. That's how you do it. You push the name forward. You make sure that you're, you're relevant and that you're in the conversation. And with uh, PKP, as they call him, 
uh, running the show, you know that the Alouettes are going to be top of mind and you can't ask for much more. The rest of it will translate as you go. If the team does well in the field, attendance will come up with it. This is the thing I think for Atlantic Canada, you need that dynamism. You need somebody that's invested in the idea. It's not just a case of, I want a football team. No, I want an enterprise. I want the football team. I want to build a market and I want to build a season ticket base and fan loyalty. Is it reasonable to think that there is private money in Atlantic Canada that will take this on? Or are we more realistically looking at the possibility of adding another community-owned team into the CFL? The the league is interesting in that we've got three fairly successful community-owned teams right now. I'm not sure which way would be the best way. I I think private money would, would be the way to go if possible. But if that is not there, is there enough interest? for it to be a community-based team. You would think that there's enough of that within somebody's reach. Now, maybe it's a consortium. Maybe there's five, six people that get together to do this. But I, you've got to believe that this is a possibility. The other thing I think it does bringing local businessmen in is, is they look beyond just the football team. It needs to be an entertainment experience, and that's what you hear with Amar Doman in BC. People, the buzz in around Vancouver has been that those games are now an event to go to. There's great food. You have a lot of fun when you're at the event. And so on top of it, it's a fantastic football game. So I think the fans today want to get something beyond the experience of just watching football. That That's certainly a big draw, but if you can bring all the other pieces in, that's important. And that's what you're seeing in professional sports in general all across North America is gone are the days where you're sitting on a metal backless bleacher and, and sitting on your spot in a row of 20 spots fighting for leg room. It's all about the fan experience. There's enhanced seating. There are micro brew local pubs in the stadiums. There's walking areas in a local local food. There's fountains in baseball stadiums where they go they explode when somebody hits a home run it's about really engaging that whole experience the challenge for an atlantic based team right now then would be how do you build that fan experience with a temporary stadium it takes time but remember too that all of the franchises that we know of today that are the core 9 all started somewhere with smaller stadiums with bench seating that's nothing unusual. The other thing that you can think about too is we we always want to think that there has to be necessarily somebody from Atlantic Canada, which would be the best possible scenario. But what about Steve Apostolopoulos, who is a Canadian, is trying to buy the Washington Commanders, according to ESPN? If he doesn't get that bid, wouldn't he be somebody that would be interested? He's a wouldn't he think about this? and say, well, if I can't get an NFL franchise, wow, what an opportunity out East. Well, that's what you need is someone who loves the game of football, but also will bring some of the the tools beyond the game to take interest in the league and say, okay, I'm going to take a chance at this. If they don't pick up the Washington Commanders, uh, it's an opportunity for them to try in the CFL and say, we can run a successful program, we can attract fans, and... I would have the ability then to go if if the goal is to move into a different area of sports entertainment to have a successful team in any market and build that market. That's the track record that they need to have Board of Governors say that, yes, we're open to having that individual pick up a team in our league. There are far more billionaires in North America than there are sports franchises. You got to think then that the, the want and the need can be met. The want of an owner, the need of an area. I'm not saying that necessarily it has to be somebody out of Toronto that owns a team in Atlantic Canada, but it's just a thought. If you're the CFL, we've had absentee owners. The Wettenhalls owned the Alouettes, and they were based out of the United States. They owned the Alouettes for a couple decades. It's not un- unheard of. It's just a question of, do you want to do that? And I know that and Randy Ambrosi is saying he'd prefer to have a made in Atlantic Canada solution, and that would imply 
having local ownership. We also, on the other side of the coin, had the Gliebermans owning the Ottawa Rough Riders at one point in time, which was not nearly as successful. But you're right, Don, it doesn't necessarily have to be an Atlantic Canada ownership group, but it certainly helps build that sense of community and that connection to the team. The more you make a connection and something that the CFO has to be better at is making that connection with the community in which it plays, not necessarily just the local team, but the league itself, you're going, you're going to grow that product and you're going to grow the affinity. Absolutely. And I do think you're seeing now that the teams are not working as much in isolation, but sharing some of the best practices of getting players in the community and how do we engage the youth and how do we have those camps. And and I think by sharing those best practices and seeing teams work together for the betterment of the league, you're definitely going to make individual teams stronger. But at the end of the day, you make the league stronger. It was great to see this week the Winnipeg Blue Bombers sent players to northern remote communities in, in Manitoba that were accessible really only by air. And they had they had players and team representatives in small communities. I know South Indian Lake was one. And if anybody wants to look at a map of Manitoba to see where South Indian Lake is located, it was great to see the team get behind, behind that kind of promotion and that kind of outreach. It's something that I've spoken to before about the impact of meeting CFL players in my small town school when I was a kid. And, and it's great to see that reignited. We're talking about players, and one of the things that Dwayne Ford mentioned and has been sort of bantied around before is player retention with member clubs. In other words, is there a way to curtail the movement with the free agent frenzy that goes on in February? And part of it is sort of looking at an NHL or an NBA or some other model where a player is with a team for, say, three years and in that time, they're a restricted free agent. You you have to compensate if you, you take that person away. Then four years and beyond, okay, you can go. One of the things that I thought of at the time, it may be tough to figure out but given the cap that we have, but I thought maybe it would be worth it to have built either within or just outside of the cap a dollar value for retention. So any player that's been with your team over three years and you want to re-sign them, maybe a portion of their salary comes out of the retention cap. One of the challenges I see is the restricted free agency in the NHL I'm more familiar with than the NBA, but I'm sure they're, they're a similar format, is it's players that you essentially draft and develop that are in their entry level and rookie contracts up to a certain length before they can become a even a restricted free agent the cfl is a little bit of a different animal in the sense that we get a lot of players coming up from the u.s would they fall under that same category or is this a situation where it's designed to help retain your canadian talent i think it's both if you're saying that after three years you're an unrestricted free agent but if the team that's losing you has now some opportunity within a a separate cap, say another half a million or whatever, to throw at three or four players to keep them around, then why not allow them to do that so that you have more continuity? One of the things that is likely to happen in Saskatchewan, just as a case in point, Keon Schaefer-Baker is going to be a free agent at the end of this upcoming season. Now, granted, he's got to come back from hip surgery, but when he gets back on the field and and performs, once he's ob- done his obligation with the Rough Riders, clearly he wants to give a shot to the NFL because he he feels, and probably quite rightly, that he belongs where the big money is. But if it doesn't work out, he's an FA coming back. What can the Riders do? There's a Canadian, there's a star. What can the Riders do to retain him? Once February hits, he can go where he wants and wherever the money beckons. I do like the idea of retaining players because then fans are more familiar with them. I do think the American players that come up here often, they'll want the opportunity to move back to the league where they can make more money. So if you're talking about that restricted free agency being if you re-sign within the CFL or you come back to the CFL, I like that idea. But I still think they need to have that window to entice some of the upper echelon players who may still have a shot at being in a practice roster in the NFL 
to come and get some more tape on them playing a game to potentially allow them not to just sit on a practice roster, but hopefully break a roster and make some real money in the NFL. You're saying that the CFL doesn't have real money? Uh, not millions of dollars per player. You may have to look at developing something like a waiver situation like they have in other sports when players are sent up and down to the to the big leagues and the minors where the team that the the player was most recently under contract with in the CFL retains that first negotiation opportunity when a player is returning from the NFL and then have to go into a, a situation where other teams perhaps would have to compensate the original rights holder. So for example, if Nathan Rourke decides to return to the CFL, regardless of how many years he's in the NFL, the BC Lions have that first opportunity. And then you look at if, if say the Montreal Alouettes want to sign him, maybe they have to compensate BC for taking that player from from their rights. Players sort of getting the opportunity to go to the States, but if you do come back, well, you've got to at least give the opportunity to the team that let you go a chance to re-sign you. If, I think it's a, it's a give and a give. Each side is giving up something. Obviously, the BC Lions lose their starting quarterback to the NFL, but for Nathan Rourke, he gets the opportunity and if it doesn't work out, then he gives up his chance to talk to eight other teams and he goes back to the Lions and says, okay, well, let's work this out. And in a situation maybe then where you've had a, a negotiation window that's exclusive and it doesn't work out, fine. Then you can talk to the other eight teams. Mm -hmm. and, and I do like the idea. Of, so if BC is not willing to pay Rourke what he thinks he's worth, but Montreal would then Montreal still needs to do something. Maybe it's a draft. Maybe it's some other way of adding some compensation. Quarterbacks, they're so highly valued because of the nature of the Canadian game. Is there a way, and work aside, but is there a way that the CFL could figure out a compensation package? Not necessarily for the starters, because they get paid well, but for the backups. Like, look at uh, Dane Evans in British Columbia and look what the contract that he signed to stay with the BC Lions. Maybe we need to bump up the cap or do something to make more money available to those guys that need some development time, don't feel like they have to chase it somewhere else. And case in point to that would be Dakota Pro Cup looking to the USFL, I believe, this season as opposed to re-signing in Winnipeg or looking at other CFL options. The money for that third string quarterback, especially in the CFL, is not huge. So comparison wise, he's getting a little bit less money to play eight fewer games in, in a spring league right now and could still look at coming north of the border once that season's over. Depending on what his physical energy is going to be after the season that he's played. Now he has to make the team there obviously as well. And what if he doesn't, then where is he left? I guess he would probably come back knocking to the blue bombers doors and seeing what he can come back with a contract. It's a tough spot because you, you've got a limited shelf life as a football player, especially uh, some certainly can play 15 years, 18 years. That's, not unheard of, but for the most part, you've got three to five and you got to make it while you can. We haven't talked about the combine yet. And one of the big stories that came out of the combine, other than the fact that there was no real live coverage on YouTube or elsewhere, was this whole notion of deferrals. And we saw a lot of eligible players defer their draft status to 2024. Now to understand the context in which this falls, these are the guys that are becoming eligible now, but they also missed a season in 2020. So the U sport executive decided that they could have one more go at this and they could defer and come back for their fifth year in 2024 Normally, they would have graduated this year. That, of course, left a lot of confusion with especially general managers and coaches who came to the combine thinking that all of these people were going to be there and a lot of them didn't show. doesn't mean that they're not going to be back in 2024, but just in the interim, it left a little bit of... And it's a difficult situation for 
people who want to draft Canadians. When you take off some of your top Canadians who want to stay in U sports for the opportunity to compete once more, because the CFL is not necessarily a guarantee for them. Some of them may choose to opt out of the CFL, which we've seen in situations like Mason Nias, who was the quarterback with uh, the Huskies, who decided not to go into the draft and, and go into coaching instead. So some of these may be taking options like that and saying, you know what, I, I'm not going to go look at pro football beyond, but I do want the opportunity to play one more season of youth sport. It's a game I love. It's just not a game I'm going to pursue as a profession. Let's not forget that U sports is also about education. They are back for another year to probably finish up a degree of some sort, which is going to open doors for them beyond football, whether they decide to pursue professional football for a few years or decide that they're done after their U sport career. Now they've got a, a university degree that they can go and explore the, the world beyond football. The last thing I would say to that is it's, it's something like junior hockey as well. Junior hockey, when you have 20-year-olds, they can actually dominate in a league. So you think now about taking a U sport who's now 24 or 25 years old as the that fifth or potentially even sixth year player playing against an 18 or 19 year old who maybe hasn't filled out their body fully. They're going to have more opportunity to look more dominant, which might also increase their uh, ranking in the draft. Well, this was a complaint years ago with U sport and especially the teams out West because there would be players that played two or three years of junior football and then move over and play five years of college football. That put them at eight years of experience, plus 25, 26, even 27 years old, playing against Eastern clubs that were made up of high school graduates. Yeah, it's not an even playing field. And I, I do like the fact that U Sports is now saying you have five years of eligibility from the time you leave high school. So some will go play junior for one or two years and then move to U Sports. COVID definitely did a number on those students, and I get it. If you didn't get the opportunity to play, you want to continue to play with your friends. And as you said, Heath, it can also be an educational decision for many of these players. In the interim, it does create some problems for the people who were in Edmonton looking to see what these people could provide in the skills competitions that are there, and now you don't have them. It does juggle the draft board quite a bit. This is part of the pandemic slash post-pandemic universe in which we live. We're still sort of filtering our way out of everything and trying to find a new sense of normalization. The draft this year will be fun to watch. It's generally has been very offensive line heavy in the early rounds of the draft, but I'm hearing that the offensive line prospects this year aren't quite as deep as in previous seasons. So we might be seeing more of the skill positions being drafted as well early on, such as receivers, running backs, maybe even a quarterback or two. It's, it's a sign of the times as we move forward. You're right. The CFL draft used to be heavily dominated by offensive linemen in the first round. Lately, that hasn't been the case. And as time goes forward, it probably will get less so. There are more and more skill position players made available to the CFL draft we may see a day where there are no offensive linemen drafted in the first round, that receivers, defensive backs, running backs, quarterbacks take over. And right now, it's a possibility, especially given the number that are starting in NCAA schools. Not all of them are going to get NFL tryouts for whatever reason. And here's your opportunity now to come back to Canada, a la Nathan Rourke. The other thing I think we have to keep in mind is that those Canadians who choose to stay in Canada and work through, I think, are now being exposed to a higher level of coaching. You have athletes as young as 15 years old who will travel with their provincial team to the United States and play in competition and exchange ideas with coaches. So I think the level of athlete and the, the training that they're receiving in Canada has certainly changed from you know when I went through in the, in the 1980s. Now you're identifying players early, they're getting more specific skilled training, and they're having the opportunity to work with coaches who aren't just 
from down the road. They're actually highly trained coaches who've done a lot of work to improve their coaching skill. And thus the athletes are comparable to some of the athletes coming out of the United States. They're still a little behind in the fact that maybe they didn't start when they're seven, eight, nine years old. But now that they're starting at 12, 13 in many provinces, you're getting a lot of time to develop those skills. The other thing, and you touched on it briefly, but the level of coaching in this country has just grown exponentially. And look at the coaches in U sport. How many of them are ex CFL players? You're getting top quality people running these programs. That makes a massive difference in terms of attitude, in terms of skill preparation, in terms of understanding the game. And that will only benefit the CFL later. Thank you for listening to our show. Third Down Gamble is hosted on Podbean and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter at Third Down Gamble. Join us again at the Third Down Gamble podcast. Audio worth watching. Third Down Gamble uses the expert resources provided by Canadian Football League player and game statistics for analytics, game notes, and statistics, and 3downnation.com for news, insight, and in-depth analysis. Please visit cfl.ca and 3downnation.com for the most up-to-date information on the Canadian Football League.